Hello and welcome back to our class again today. We are continuing our study in Isaiah 40 through 66 called Our Father's Business. And today we are ready for Isaiah 65 in the book of Jude. So before we start, let's just go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you and praise you so much that you are sovereign over all, that you are Lord over all creation, and that you are Lord of our lives as well. And thank you so much for um, calling us and choosing us to be your own. Thank you for your word. And God, I pray that as we go to your word today, that you would reveal yourself to us, God, that you would give clarity and understanding. And Father, we look only to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, go ahead and get your Bibles and you can follow along in the book of Jude. But I've titled this one, Upholding Truth, um, because once again, and I sound like a broken record here, but once again, we are talking about um, upholding the truth in the midst of these false teachers that are trying to tear down the truth and trying to um, be very deceptive, actually, in their in their manner, the way that they seek to introduce uh, their falsehood into the body of Christ. And so um, it's really important that we uphold the truth, and we're going to find out ways that we do that as we go through this lesson today. Um, but to start with, Isaiah 65 is really an answer, God's answer to Isaiah 64. And so I want to go back to Isaiah 64 briefly and just mention that, you know, in Isaiah 64, the people are calling out to the Lord, why aren't you um, answering us? Why aren't you um, coming to our, our help and our aid? And yet the people insist on living in such a way that um, displeases God and they are um, living by their own way in their own terms. And they want Jesus to be this person um that they've created in their own minds rather than who he really is. And so um, Isaiah 60, 64, 12 says, After this, all this, Lord, must you still refuse to help us? Will you continue to be silent and punish us? And God gives this answer in Isaiah 65. And he says, you know, the Lord says, I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. In other words, they didn't want the kind of help that God was offering them. I was ready to be found, but no one was looking for me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that did not call in my name. And we see here the gospel is front center. In Hebrews 10, 4 through 7 and verse 9, it says, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me then i said here i am it is written about me in the scroll i have come to do your will O god and then it says it again later down in the passage it says here i am i have come to do your will and jesus is presenting himself before us saying i am right here i am the gospel this is what you need this is um, i've given you all you need to find life in my name and that is just to simply believe it's a free gift that he's offered us and yet so often we want to come around to um, having God bend to our terms and our ways and this is what Israel was doing was saying you know we want God to attend to our ways instead of submitting to his ways and the Lord says, you know, I'm right here. I'm here. Um, listen to me. I have provided a way for you. And so we see the gospel is front center, but the people are wanting their own own way of coming to God. Um, they want God on their terms. And then in Jude chapter 1, verse 1, it starts out with Jude introducing who he is. The, the letter, it says, is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. And we see here, we know from other sources that um, James and and Jude both are actually half-brothers of Jesus. And um, knowing the nature of siblings, this is quite a statement that both brothers would admit to submitting to Jesus, calling him their Lord and Savior. And James in one one says, this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a testimony. Um, this presents strong evidence toward Jesus as the true Messiah. Um, and they both speak of themselves as his slaves. And so what then does that say for us? Should we not submit to God as our master and Lord all the more? And um, we see here that there is this, we come back to this, we, we saw this in First Peter, we saw this um, through um, James and other places that we need to submit to the Lord as our master and live by his, his terms for living. And um, 
uh, that we can't just think that we can create Jesus to be the person we want him to be, to fit our way of living. And so Jude 1, 1 through 2 speaks about those who truly know God. It says, I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. And again here we see that those who are truly the servants of God um, are those who are called by those who God has called himself, that he loves us and he keeps us in his care. And, you know, there's many who claim to follow Christ, but in reality, they don't follow him at all. And God keeps those who are his true servants. In Matthew 7, 21 through 22, there's some strong words that says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me you evildoers. And so um, we have to make sure that we truly know God and are saved only by the work of Christ, by his death and resurrection on the cross, by his blood shed for us, that by trusting in that, believing that we that we have done wrong, that we need him, that we need a savior, that there's no work that we can do of our own to be saved only by the work of Christ. And Isaiah 65 verses 2 through 3 it speaks of this as well. It says, All day long I open my arms to a rebellious people, but they follow their own evil paths and their own crooked schemes. All day long they insult me to my face by worshiping idols in their sacred gardens. They burn incense on pagan altars. And so God is saying, you know, here I am. I'm right before you. Just simply come, come and receive the gift of salvation that I have offered you. And so in Jude 1 verse 3, um, it speaks about this gospel that remains the same. It says, Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. So God has entrusted the gospel to us one time. He only had to die once for the sins of all people, and it was for all time. And um, the gospel does not change. Um, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if a false teacher is coming along and introducing a new doctrine, we know that it's. we need to be careful because it's probably not true um, because the gospel doesn't change. And God has entrusted this gospel to his holy people. He's called us out to be holy. And, and the same message and the same fruit, salvation that leads to holiness. Um, and so in Jude 1, 4, it goes on to say, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. And so these that are um, ungodly, who are the false teachers, they, they worm their way. I, that phrasing is is kind of creepy to me that they worm their way by deception into our churches and saying that we can live however we want, that we can live immoral lives. And yet the condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. We call him Lord and master. Is he truly our Lord? Does, is he the boss of our lives? Um, and these people that worm their way into the churches um, and say that you can live however you want, they refuse to submit to Christ as their master and Lord. And so Isaiah 65, 4 through 5 speaks again. It says, At night they go out among the graves, worshiping the dead. They eat the flesh of pigs and make stews with other forbidden foods. Yet they say to each other, Don't come too close or you will defile me. I am holier than you. These people are a stench in my nostrils, an acrid smell that never goes away. And so we see here that false teachers, they're, they're promoting lies in the church and they're subtle lies. They're sneaky while they claim to be holy. And, you know, we're called not to live by lies, but by truth. And, um, and because these false teachers live by their own terms, then they're always seeking to prove their own goodness. And their, their goal is to, to prove themselves. And yet our goal is not um, a good life achieved by self-effort, but rather a life that is lived in Christ. That is our goal. And um, 
And here we see that, that these are, are prideful too. They claim that they are holier than others or better than others, superior. Um, again, thinking they have secret knowledge makes people feel that they are superior. And, and God calls us to humility as well. Um, and, but, and so their judgment is sure. And in um, Isaiah 65 speaks of this as well as does Jude, that the judgment is a sure thing. Isaiah 65, 6 through 7 says, Look, my decree is written out in front of me. I will not stand silent. I will repay them in full. Yes, I will repay them both for their own sins and for those of their ancestors, says the Lord. For they also burn incense on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will pay them back in full. And so we see here that the judgment is a sure thing. And we have examples of God's judgment upon the ungodly, but of course all in his time. And these examples are found in Jude, mentions them from Old Testament examples, Jude 1, 5 through 6. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. Um, and I remind you of the angels who who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. So we see the example here of um, the angels that left um, left the presence of God and chose to rebel against him, and then also of the, the nation of Israel who um, left Egypt, and God did all those miracles for them, and yet when they came to the promised land, they refused to enter because they did not believe, and they chose to live in fear rather than faith, and so these were destroyed. They were left to wander in the desert for 40 years until all that generation had passed away, and then their children God brought their children into the promised land, but that was as an example of God's judgment upon those who refused to believe. And Jude 1, 7 again goes on and says, And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. This is sobering here that um, we need to be careful that we're not... Um, assimilating the culture into our lives and becoming part of that because the, the judgment of that is sure and um, and God will not let the wicked go unpunished. And yet Isaiah 65 8 speaks about how God will not destroy them all for just as good grapes are found among a cluster of bad ones so I will not destroy all Israel for I still have true servants there. I will preserve a remnant of the people of Israel and of Judah to possess my land. Those I choose will inherit it, and my servants will live there. And again, going back to the, the example of, of Israel leaving Egypt way back during the, the days of Moses, and then Joshua leading them into the promised land, we see here that, that God preserved his people and re preserved a remnant of his people to go in and, and take possession of the land. And, and likewise, God has preserved his people. Those who are his true servants um, are, are those that are his. And the, these false teachers are not his true servants. Um, Jude 1.1, 1, 1, again, we come back to verse 1 where it says, We're called by God the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. We are called, we are loved, and we are kept in the care of Jesus Christ. And we see examples of that um, or teaching about that in John 10, verses 25 through 30. Jesus answered, I tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. But Jesus says, by contrast, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. And so we are kept once again by the work of Christ, not by our own works, but by the work of Christ. And so therefore that cannot be taken away from us because God's work on the cross cannot be undone. And, um, and so God keeps us. He keeps those who are his true servants, keeping us only unto himself. Isaiah 65, 10 speaks about, again, the godly. The plain of Sharon will again be filled with flocks for my people who have searched for me, and the valley of Achor will be a place to pasture herds. And I'm reminded of Psalm 23, 1 through 3, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. And again, those who submit to God as their Lord and Master, who believe um, that Jesus took the 
punishment for their own sin on the cross, um, these are ones who are his true followers of Christ, those regenerated by the Spirit of God. And these God promises to lead by green pastures and beside quiet waters. And John 10, 7 through 9, Jesus said, Again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. And again, we see that God has good things in store for his people, those who will submit to him as their Lord and master. And then Isaiah 65, 11 through 12 says, But because the rest of you have forsaken the Lord and have forgotten his temple, and because you have prepared feasts to honor the God of fate and have offered mixed wine to the God of destiny, now I will destine you for the sword. All of you will bow down before the executioner. For when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen. You deliberately sinned before my very eyes and chose to do what you know I despise. And this is in contrast to, you know, the people calling out to him and saying, answer us. And yet when God called, they would not answer. And when God spoke, they would not listen. And um, Psalm 23, again, that, that the Lord guides those that are his in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so there will be fruit from the life of those who are truly his, the fruit of holiness and righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer. And so Jude 1 8 says, In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But these people scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them. And so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them? For they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. Like Balaam, they deceive people for money. And like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. And so he gives examples here of of Cain and Balaam and Korah, who all rebel against the Lord and have impure motives for what they are doing. And it reminds me of John 10, 12 through 14, once again, where it says the hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, says Jesus. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. If, um, if if we claim to know God, we will live in a way that honors him um, and in a way that um, pleases him that is, is not, um, if we continue in sin, that's like a slap in the face to God of his sacrifice. I mean, why did he go to such sacrifice on the cross? only to have us continue living in sin. And so he died so that we would be delivered from sin and no longer dwell in it, um, to to dwell in holiness. And again, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, And so Jude 1 12 gives us a warning about those who would seek to lead us astray. It says, when these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. We just read about that in John 10. They are like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. And you remember we we talked about this earlier in Isaiah about that. They are like wandering stars doomed forever to blackest darkness. And so um, God warns us against these false teachers that need to be um, not tolerated in the church, that they need to be put away from the body of Christ because like cancer in the body, they will infect and, and cause great destruction. Then we need to just cut that out of the body. And so Isaiah 65, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says in verses 13 through 15. My servants will eat, but you will starve. My servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be sad and ashamed. My servants will sing for joy, but you will cry in sorrow and despair. Your name will be a curse word among my people, for the sovereign Lord will destroy you and will call his true servants by another name. Again, here we see the contrast between those who are truly Um, the Lord's servants, those who belong to the Lord, and those who do not belong to him. And we need to be careful not to be deceived by those who do not really belong to the Lord and yet claim that they are following the Lord. These are the false teachers. Um, And Jude 1, 14 through 16, Enoch said, Listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and complainers, living only to satisfy their desires. 
They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. And this is, this is again, sobering because how often do we grumble and complain and how often do we live to satisfy our own desires? We need to be careful that we are not joining with those in that camp. I'm joining with the wicked because when Jesus returns, there will be a great revealing of those who are his true servants and those who are not. And the wicked will receive their just punishment. But there's no middle ground. We're either with Christ or against him. And, and so we need to make sure that we are living in, in surrender to our Lord as, as our master and be with him um, and not dwelling among and joining with those who are against him. And Jude one seventeen says, But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ said. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's Spirit in them. And so we need to be cautioned against those who worm their way into our church fellowship who are not truly part of the body of Christ. And by their fruit they are known. And we need to see that these who cause divisions in the body of Christ are not ones who are with Christ at all. And um, be watching out for that. And so um, that's kind of our defense, but what's what's our offense? And our offense is to build, pray, and to wait. And Jude one twenty says, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And reminds me of John 15, 9 through 10, where it says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. So God calls us to remain close to him, to draw near to God, and he will draw near to us, James 4. And um, and to have this constant awareness of the mercy of God really does keep us in a state of humility. The moment we think that God... um, I don't know, it owes us something, or the moment we think that um, we deserve something, then pride creeps in, and all of a sudden we we um, live in, in a way that is not grateful or is unthankful. And so we have to have this constant awareness of the mercy of God to keep us in the state of humility. And then in that state of humility, we know that we have a great need for God, and we pray for the Holy Spirit to empower us to live and dwell in holiness. And so we we build each other up in the Lord. We encourage one another. We pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we wait for his return. This world is not our home, and we don't want to get too attached here because our true home is in heaven. So we wait. We eagerly await for the return of Christ. And then as, as we seek peace with one another and in the body of Christ, we have to be careful that it's not at the expense of holiness or of truth. And Jude one twenty two speaks about, you know, you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. And we see here that we're to reach out um, to those who are influenced by false teaching. It doesn't mean that that we reach out to the false teachers themselves. In fact, we, we need to avoid the, the false teaching, but we pursue those who are vulnerable, who are influenced by their false teaching. And our purpose is to show mercy and bring them back into the fellowship. And Hebrews 12, 14 very um, powerful verse says make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy without holiness no one will see the lord and peace doesn't mean we just comply with everything that comes along that we comply with with um with unrighteousness with ungodliness it means that 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 peace often doesn't come about until there is confrontation or until there is a conflict and we need to um, to make sure that we are not sacrificing holiness for the sake or the name of peace, that we make every effort to live at peace with all men, but to be holy. And we don't sacrifice holiness in the name of peace. And without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so it's important that we uphold holiness while pursuing peace. Um, And so God has great things in store for those who truly belong to him. Isaiah 65, 17, and actually the whole passage to the end through 23, um, it says, Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. 
In those days, people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune, for they are people blessed by the Lord, and their children too will be blessed. And so we see here that that God um, has rewards for those who truly are his servants, who truly follow him, who who live by the spirit and not by the flesh. And that, that God is creating this new heavens and a new earth where no sin will abound there, that no, the presence of sin will be um, taken away, and that there will be a, um, a, a reward for those who... Um, have have served God faithfully, a reward for faithfulness. Um, heaven it, it will be a place ruled by righteousness, and so believers will be removed from the presence of evil. Um, and those who remain condemned choose to be separated from God in this in the place of torment. And you know, false teachers they seek to prove themselves worthy, but believers we have nothing to prove, for our trust is not in our own goodness, but in the work of Christ on our behalf by the power of his Holy Spirit dwelling within us, the work that he does through us. And John 3, 18, and then verses 35 through 36 says, Whoever believes in him, that is Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So those who put their faith in God are delivered from the wrath of God, because Jesus already took that wrath on the cross when he died for us. Um, But those who do not believe remain under God's wrath. Very sad place to be. But Isaiah 65, 24 um, ends with just a great hope. It says, I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. God is sovereign over all. He knows the future as well as the past. And he is the great I am who is in our present. And he knows what we need. And he answers often before we even call to him. He is eager and willing to answer those who are truly his own, who call on his name in truth. And this is in stark contrast to those who claim to follow Christ, but in reality don't know him at all. And so it is God who keeps us secure in his hand. We look only to him as Lord and master over our lives. And Jude 1, 24 through 25 ends with this glorious promise. It says, Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. And so we see here that it is God who keeps us from falling away, who keeps us from being deceived, and that he will bring us into his glorious presence. And um, he will present us before God, faultless before the throne, because the blood of Christ covers us. And by the blood of Christ, we are declared righteous in his sight. And that, that God is ruler and master over all. And he will receive all the glory and all the praise. That's it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. And next week we will cover Isaiah 66, our last chapter in Isaiah, and Revelation. And then after that we will do a review lesson. So um, be sure to come back for the review lesson. We're going to hope to wrap it all together. And then we will be completed with this um, Sunday school class. So thank you so much for being here and I will see you next week.